Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Summit Distinguished Speaker Series, which is a part of the Silicon Valley Falls Summit 2020 experience. We are so excited to have Matt Rogers with us here today. Matt is the founder of Insight.org and also the co-founder of Nest. Our moderator for today's session is Cheryl Root. Cheryl is the program director for the MSTV program and associate professor of the practice for the Integrated Innovation Institute. Um, Shreya Agarwal is an MSTV student at the CMUSB campus who's also here with us today, and she will be moderating the Q&A portion of today's talk. We have some questions that were submitted in advance, but if you have questions for Matt, um, you are free to submit them using the Q&A feature in Zoom, and Shreya will address those questions to Matt at the end. Um, so without further ado, awesome. let's get started. I'll turn it over to Cheryl. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you very much, and welcome, everybody. Good morning from Silicon Valley. Uh, my name again, Cheryl, and with me is Shreya, who is also my TA for the program, as well as my, some of my courses. Um, and she'll be introducing questions that have been submitted, as well as those that you've added into uh, the Q&A box. And I want to thank very much um, Stephanie and the team from Silicon Valley Campus here for creating and setting up this wonderful environment. So without further ado, Let's begin. So the iPhone is embedded in all of our lives and um, Nest products are everywhere in our homes and Insight now is bringing forward climate issues. And so we're fortunate to have the creator of these changes with us today for this chat. Join me in welcoming Matt Rogers, who is going to share his journey, share his innovations and challenges along the way, and what is needed to sustain the ability to have these kinds of new solutions that will improve our lives, sustaining not only here in Silicon Valley, but on a global basis in our whole climate and our environments. So Matt, let's get started at the beginning. Um, I was fascinated uh, about how much you give back to CMU. You are remarkable in sharing uh, your insights, your thoughts, and your guidance. But Tell us what brought you to CMU and what life is like, because I understand you were at CMU, then you were at Apple, then you were at CMU, and then you went back to Apple. Talk about that journey and what your thoughts were through that. Yeah, uh, so, so, so I, I grew up in a small town in rural Florida, uh, Gainesville. Most people never heard of it, but they'd probably heard of the university there. Uh, and I've always, I grew up always fascinated with technology and robots and was super, super fortunate uh, to, you know, like I applied early decision and, and got in and I was thrilled to go to CMU and learn how to build robots. Uh, I, spent the, I spent the first couple of years like getting into everything. I was one of those folks who kind of overdid it. So I took like six courses per semester and mm -hmm. uh, kind of definitely did the overload uh, uh, path. Uh, and I learned a ton, I mean, about electronics and mechatronics and you know soft building software systems and uh did some really cool work at the ri uh building robotic hands and control systems it was really fortunate uh at the end of my junior ish senior ish year uh to get an internship at, at apple in silicon valley uh and i didn't actually realize how lucky it was at the time but in hindsight it was pretty much the like it was like the, the most fortunate thing that's probably could have happened because uh, I ended up at Apple in 2004 on the exact right team working with the exact right people. Uh, I ended up in the printer cube uh, of the iPod team uh, outside the office of the then uh, VP of iPod, Tony Fidel, who ended up being my business partner at Nest. So like kind of landed in the exact right place at the right time with the right people. Uh, it's, you know, it's good to, when, when fortune smiles at you, you take advantage of it. So uh, as, as an intern out in Apple, I, I worked my butt off and like, the, like you know, it was one of those times when uh, my, my, my manager had to call me to tell me to go home on Saturday <laughs> night kind of thing. Uh, yeah. And Cheryl, as you said, like uh, I actually, they asked me to stay. So like I was, I was the intern that they, they wanted me not to go back to school and right. my, 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 my Jewish mother would have been very upset with me if I, <laughs> I did, if I dropped out of school. So went back to CMU and finished my undergrad and master's that year. And uh, I already had a job waiting for me. So it was, it, that, that was a, a, a big relief. <laughs> so, so what, 
when you look at it, you've been an entrepreneur almost all your life then uh, in terms of creating new products. I try to talk to our students that you don't have to be just in a startup company to create new products. Right. You can be in corporations and small businesses. You can be out there. So when you, when you look at your career and the chunks that you have, do you think entrepreneurship is an inherent skill or can it be taught? Oh, it definitely can be taught. I, I, I was certainly not born with it. Actually, uh, I, I think myself actually as someone who's fairly risk averse. Uh, uh, in fact, like, I, I don't like to take risks. So mm-hmm. and actually, I think it's, it's a characteristic that you could learn, but also like great entrepreneurs know how to balance risk and like, you know, when, like, when to lean in, when, when to take a step back and those kinds of things. Uh, I, I would say like the most important, like you mentioned like big company versus startup. Uh, I think more important than size is the team and who you'd be working with and oh. learning from. And you know, as I said, like I lucked out being at the exact right place with the right people at the right time. Uh, you know, and I, as I talk to folks, you know, I, I hire a lot of people over the years and uh, what I often tell them is like, which team will you be working with and what will you learn? And, and who, will you, you know, are those the folks that you want to work with with the rest of your life? And mm-hmm. uh, that's, that's certainly more important than the size of the company. Yeah, learning how to learn, I think, is a big thing that I get from the CMU environment here is that they work on the three levels, not only the content of what you're doing, but the network and the experience of applying it. And then ultimately that learn how to learn so that you can learn all your life. That's right. And I think think, think that's, you know, so going back a little, let's talk a little bit more about that product management kind of thinking. Um, what was the most challenging part of working on the iPhone? And I know the environment. I know Alvy Ray Smith and the guys that had to work in some of the strange environment there. What was your um, approach in creating that product that customers love so much? We can't get rid of it. We, I mean, it's almost glued to my ear half the time. I mean, it's funny. Like, again, hindsight's twenty twenty on this one. At the time, we actually didn't know people were going to like it. <laughs> and, and, and th- th- there was a lot of skepticism within Apple at the time. If it, if the iPhone was going to, we didn't know it was going to be called the iPhone, but the, mm-hmm. the purple project, if it was going to be a runaway hit. And actually think about like, if you rewind back, like I was one of the first engineers on that project, but I was also one of the most junior engineers. Like I had just finished school. Mm. So you th- think about like, if they're going to put wow. the most junior guy on it, <laughs> it could have been that like, yeah, like, you know, it, it was definitely not a bet the farm kind of opportunity when we first started, but uh, it definitely like it, it grew there very quickly. Like by, by, by the time we were, let's call it halfway through development of that first product, like half of Apple was descending on this product. Uh, and I, I think it's one of those, like once we started using it uh, and like really no one person other than probably Steve had the whole picture in their hand. Uh-huh. We all had our piece that we were innovating on, but yeah. uh, it was pretty clear we were on something special. Uh, but like doing a 1.0, like doing a first of anything is a crazy experience crazy. because you don't know the problems that you're like when, when you're doing it a, a second version or a third version, like you kind of know what some of the pitfalls might be, but man, like we had no idea what we we're going to fall into. And we had you know, antenna issues and we had, you know, interference between displays and touch and, you know, cell phone service and like a entirely new software stack and new Silicon. It was just like all, it was every, everything was hard. A hundred percent. Everything was hard. And, at the same time, like it was a, an all hands on deck across two continents. So like we had the big team out in California working on it, but actually I spent most of my time actually out in China on the manufacturing, the building oh. side. So like it's 24 seven and you know, like people aren't sleeping. It was, it was total chaos. It was great. Yeah. Global, global product development can be really challenging on the body from a time point of view. Sure is. <laughs> so, um, what if you look at today now? Then you you moved into the nest at this point. And I'm going to come back to how why you shifted. But you know when you started the concept of nest, we didn't have smart homes at the time. Yeah. Nobody really was thinking about that. So what was your journey in in venturing into the nest with Tony? Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean there existed connected products at home. Yes. Uh, yeah. But they weren't very good. Uh, right. I think actually similar analogy, like there existed smartphones uh, before the iPhone and there were music players before the iPod. Right. But what, what lacked was kind of that end-to-end design thinking and kind of that whole product DNA. Like that wasn't there. Uh, and you know, I, I think 
you know, what we saw is not just an opportunity to build a whole industry, but how do you innovate it one product at a time? And like, it's really, you know, it's, it's hard, if not impossible to build a platform. Like, yeah. Well, you know, the, the interesting thing products. is that they, they all kind of work together. And, and did you start at the beginning thinking you'd create IoT for the home? Or did you uh, just we, make sure you had we a knew where we wanted to go. Yeah, we knew where we wanted to go. But actually, uh, I mean, thinking like this was part of my partner's brilliance at the time was like, you don't start at the end. You start with one discrete, incredible product. Uh, you get, you bring people in, uh, you get them excited you build scale momentum and then you do a second product mm -hmm. uh, and then you do a third and then a fourth and a fifth. And mm -hmm. over time, like, you know, you could, a platform can emerge, but you do it through great products because if you don't have great products, no one's coming to the party. Yeah. So how difficult then was it to get funding when you're thinking one product? Uh, easy yet very hard. Uh, <laughs> uh, at the time, it's like hardware was very out of vogue in Silicon Valley there were very few people who would write checks to companies building real products, mm -hmm. like real being like, let's call it not just software. Uh, so like that already kind of limited the pool and then limiting the pool, pool further was we we're building a thermostat and it was probably like the least sexy thing you can imagine. Uh, uh, so like that further narrowed the pool to like people who were really true believers in us. Right. Uh, and that's how we, that's how we did it. So it was easy in that like, the investors we worked with really believed in us and had our backs, but it was really hard in that, like, there were not too many people who were going to do that. Yeah. Yeah, it's a little bit like Tesla's story that they had to start in a market where there were people concerned about um, ec the ecology, as well as wanting a fancy, nice car to drive and not a cheese whiz kind of a car. And also, they can only start with the first one and then evolve to, like, the S3 and now all the things. We have very, actually, like, like, Nest and, and Tesla, there's a lot of parallels, like in terms of like the strategy of like you start more at the premium end and then you work your way down. So it's a very, very it's a, similar. It's, it's a yeah. very similar strategy. Yeah. I love the way you described though the old Honeywell uh, thermostat because I had one of those in my home at the time. And it was just, it always drove me crazy because it never worked, even though they said it was quote programmable. It never was. Yeah. I mean, these things are really hard. I mean, that, that was the key user experience insight that because yeah. those products were so hard to use. We right. have forgotten about those products at this point. They were so hard to use. That's why people were wasting energy. Uh, so like simply by making a product that was easy to use, we could kind of send people on the journey towards energy savings. Yeah. So, okay. So now here you are at Apple and now you're switching to Nest. What, what was the criteria that, that you made you decide, I'm going to go try this? That's a risk. You stepped yeah. out of the box. Yeah. And, and again, like very risk averse. Um, <laughs> right. Uh, it was really about purpose. And like at the time when I was contemplating leaving Apple, you know, I was a senior manager, I had a pretty big team working on right. pretty much all these hot products at Apple. Uh, but yeah, kind of looking around the room, we had all these great engineers kind of at the top of their game, working on a platform for Angry Birds and Fruit Ninja at the time. And like, just, you know, like there's something better we could have done with our time, especially given the, let's call it grand challenges of humanity. Yeah, and, and then, you know, that's that's the kind of thing that you know I, I would want to spend my my time on, and uh, you know you got you got to work on things that matter, and right. you know it was very easy to like kind of do the the look at the mirror and say like it's time to work on something that's more important. Yeah, you know that's funny. We have a grand challenge course in the um, Triple I program that exposes students to solving real problems, solving you know things that society cares about. And one of the things I always tell my students: if you're looking just to build another app, you've come to the wrong place. Yeah, I mean, like, especially in 2020, like we are. This was the year of grand challenges, and yeah. I think about like global oh, totally. pandemics and the climate crisis, election security, and like they're like. Everything got thrown at this at, at right. us this year. It is in our face. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, we got to work on problems that matter. I agree. I agree. So with the thousands of the gadgets out there, you worked on three of the biggest all time. Okay. When you think about the the iPod, the iPhone, and Nest, what what do you think stood out that customers love what you produce so well? Why why did they come to you? Yeah, I think I think I think I mean it's multi part, but I think one of the important things we learned actually, and we learned this at Apple, 
was it's not just about making something as beautiful and easy to use. It has to make rational sense too. Mm. Uh, so you're kind of balancing both sides of the brain. Uh, and at Nest, we really hone this. So, you know, you, kind of, you get brought in because it's beautiful. Like, wow, it looks good. <laughs> that's look great on my wall, but right. very quickly it gets rationalized and saying, oh, it's going to pay for itself. I'm going to save money. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's easy to justify the expense. And then like over time, you feel really good because you're doing the right thing. You're seeing the green leaf, you're saving energy. Uh, and then you tell your friends because you're feeling great. And like, those are the kind of products that really hit is like when you're able to kind of nail all three of those things. Right, right. So um, let's, let's go into the muddy water. What were some of the mistakes if you want to share them uh, along the way that you learned? Tons, 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 tons. <laughs> okay, so probably my, I think like biggest strategic mistake I've maybe I've ever made in my career uh, is like how, how much to push on going broad versus going deep. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and like maybe, maybe there's no right answer to this question, but at Nest, uh, we decided pretty early, like let's call it like year two, year three, that we were going to go broad before we go deep. Uh, mm -hmm. So like we did a smoke alarm, then we you know we, we, we bought drop cam, we started doing cameras, we did a security system, like kept on going broader, broader, broader. Where like, it's hard to, I mean, I get hindsight 2020 on this one, but did we do the right thing? Would have been better to go super deep on home energy and then maybe super deep on home safety before we you know kept on you know kind of going product by product so yeah, yeah maybe there's no right answer to this one but like it's one of those things i i always look back on like did we make the right call oh uh, yeah so okay um a friend of mine andy cunningham is is a great lady uh that also worked at apple and she was doing all of marketing for steve at the time she wrote a book called aha mm -hmm. and how do you get to aha so what were the aha moments that you had in getting that rational side of that equation? Yeah, I think when, when we realized that uh, a simple product at home, uh, like at scale could have kind of global impact. I think that, that was the key aha moment. So you know, like we knew we could make a product that saves energy. We knew we could make a product that's easy to use. But when we realized that as you kind of aggregate these things together when you have millions of homes all saving energy, you effectively can group them up and like you have a virtual power plant. I think that was one of those key moments where like, oh, this is not just a consumer story, this is a utility story too. Mm -hmm. And you know, I think about like where Nest really kind of hit the gas and scaled, uh, it's where not only were we selling to consumers, but we were getting energy rebates and utility companies were buying 50,000 at a time. And like, then it's a hockey stick. Yeah, you know, it, it, the uh, hindsights are, are really great. It's a money back totally. quarterback, Monday quarterbacking kind of thing. Um, and so what advice then, looking as you look back, what advice would you give to our students or our future entrepreneurs here in watching out for those opportunities? How do you recognize it? Yeah, I, I think one of the processes that we, we did that I'd, I'd suggest, and actually it's, it's almost like a lost art, is having good governance. Mm. So like, you know, having a, a good sounding board of a board, yeah. uh, actually like using your board for those big strategic conversations. Uh, Tony and I, I'll be, even though we had control and all those kind of things, we still like, we took our board super seriously. And every quarter when we got together, like it was a deep presentation on the state of the business and the roadmap and strategy and competition, kind of the whole nine yards. And it's, it was good for that, but actually it was really good for us. Because you know, as entrepreneurs, you're super heads down. And how often do you pop up and look at the whole forest? Right. And then take our board presentation and do it with the whole company. Uh, so like it's, it was a good forcing function for the whole company to get on board with the strategy of, 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 of the plan, right? Right. That's good advice. Yeah. And I'm, uh, the other thing is I'm really glad that people like yourself are willing to talk to our Venture Bridge people and make sure that you impress that upon them. Because I think, you know, we've got some challenges that are being resolved, but the issue is keeping not just a technology and use perspective, but the, the larger business perspective. Exactly. Yeah, again, like, I get, like good board dynamics are, are a dying art. And I think it's, it's super, super important. Somewhere mm -hmm. in the last 10 years, things became so entrepreneur friendly. And that, that's a great thing, but you want to be entrepreneur friendly, but also have their back at the same time. And right. uh, like, yeah, like, you, you want boards that are, are, are going to pose the hard questions, challenge the entrepreneur, and make them stronger. Right. So now you sold Nest, and you have a couple of bucks in your pocket now. 
Um, what, what was your biggest concerns? What caused you to shift into the more issues around society and sustainable uh, environment? As we mentioned, it's, it, they're, they're in our face every day. It's hard to ignore them. Yeah. I, I, I just could never, I mean, you can't be one of those kind of people who are sitting on the sidelines. And, yeah. You know, well, you know. there's a lot of people that agree. I did a, a discussion at my home one time and Ray Lane was there and mm -hmm. we, we got in, I, I divided everybody up into teams to solve some sustainability. And the one that we took on was the carbon issue. So we started working on what's the net present value of carbon issues on the products that we are using. Mm -hmm. Have you ever thought about doing something along that line relative to the all these um, gadgets and things that we're creating what happens to our carbon as a result of that? Well, hundred percent. Like, like, that, that was the awakening I had probably four or five years ago. Like, you know, like w w climate enormous problem, not heading in the right direction. Uh, and there's lots of great ways of kind of, you know, stemming the tide. But uh, it was it became very obvious that we needed to kind of undo the damage we did, and that's what got me into the kind of thinking about carbon removal and taking CO two out of the air and the entire movement that my insight team has helped build there. Yeah. Tell us a little bit more about your insight team. Cause I think this is really a great thing. Yeah. I, I, like we've, we've got a, it's, it's kind of a different way of looking at things and that, uh, you know, there's a lot of folks who like, you know, it's like they make some money and they become angel investors. And uh, that's not what we wanted to do. Uh, what we want to do is find the folks out there uh, who are on, like, let's call it like one of these grand challenge missions uh, mm -hmm. but needed not just capital, but our help. Uh, right. And it didn't matter if they were building a company or building a movement or building a new policy center. Uh, we were going to get behind them and do it with them. Mm -hmm. And so like, it's kind of like we're angel investors, but like we are mission driven angel investors in more things than just startups. Mm -hmm. Good. I, you know, the, I think that um, one of my students had the opportunity to talk to you. She's Sarica, who is working on trying to reduce waste in landfills. And, uh, you know, she was just totally impressed with the advice that you gave her. Um, and the more students that we get engaged like that, the more we'll solve some of these problems, I think. That's right. Um, yeah, so, 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 you know, I, I, again, I, somewhere in the last decade, it became out of favor. And I hope, like, actually, Fortunately, things are going the other direction. It became out of favor to do hard problems. And so, uh, yeah. So what is Chewy? Tell me what Chewy is. Uh, uh, new early project that I'm working on with some some of my old Nest and Apple colleagues. Uh, again, like looking at another grand challenge that is vastly overlooked. Okay. And it's still a secret then? Still super early. I, you know, like We're still in our first year. Okay. Uh, but again, like, like, there are so many of these epic sized human problems that don't have teams working on them. And, yeah. I, and this was one like that, you know, at Insight, we look at so many things and I've been little, like looking at waste and specifically like, like not a lot of great teams working on waste. So I had to jump in myself too. <laughs> okay. Well, that brings up a good point because um, what I, I was going to ask you, what's the criteria you consider when you do decide to invest? What are the Top three criteria for, you know, you're mentioning team. Is it ability to execute on the idea or the impact? What are the things you look for to say, this looks good? Yeah, be, so because we are so early, you know, uh, we're not looking at the business. We're not looking mm -hmm. at the product. It is really like, do we believe in the founders? Mm -hmm. And is, is the mission of appropriate size and scale and, and significance to humankind? Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, like, like frankly, like this is another conversation we don't have often as investors: is are these people who should be given the opportunity to build massive wealth? And you know, I think about like uh, Silicon Valley has built a very horrible rec rep reputation the last few years on let's call it like mega billionaires who are funding let's call it like Trump administration all, right all throughout there. Uh, you know, are these folks who have the right mission orientation that like, if they're successful in 10 years, they're going to do the right thing. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I just listened to Bill Gates the other day um, and how much he's investing in looking at not just the, the world's problems relative to food and water and things, but now looking into this whole virus thing mm -hmm. and the, trying to speed up and enhance the ability to solve the problem, not just bat it around. Yeah. I, I, I actually, I, I've done a lot of work with, uh, Bill and his team the last couple of years. And uh, there's definitely 
he's someone to look up to. Like, it, he puts his money where his mouth is. He works on really important problems. Yeah. Uh, and he's very open about them and transparent about them. I, I, uh, very much admire. Actually, it's funny you should, you should mention Bill Gates. So, like, Bill came to CMU in 2002 or 2003 and did a lecture. Uh, and, you know, it was like huge pack uh, uh, auditoriums. And I was super inspired. I was like, one day I'm going to be like that guy. And I'm still <laughs> chasing the dream. Not not there yet, but I'm, I'm working on You're it. You're close. You're close, yeah. Dylan. <laughs> yeah, I, I got the opportunity to meet him many years ago when I was working with Mike Maples, who was head of software and I was also helping to run the company. And he was one of my advisors as I was going through Stanford. And we had the opportunity to sit down with Bill and he was really wanting to know what was I going to do that could last? He always asked me that kind of a question. Yes. And, and that, that, that's something that stuck with me all along. So what's your favorite mentoring advice that you're giving out? Tell me a great story of mentoring. Oh, man. I mean, I, it's super personal. And I think like the, the best like mentorship relationships are like when you really can get into like the psychology of growth and growth mindset. And I, I, you know, there's a, there's almost like a blurry line between a good therapist and a good coach. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. So I, 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 some of the best like mentorship relationships that I have now like, are really about helping people frame a growth mindset. And even like when adversity comes your way, like how do you find the opportunity in those situations and grow out of them? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I also tell students uh, that you'll have many mentors as you go along in your learning and your growth, that you want mentors that keep pushing you forward, um, sort of like wanting to jump the high bar in the Olympics, don't quit right. at 13 feet. Um, and sometimes that takes a different sort of uh, advice. So what fun what fun things are you doing? Oh, so in, given the pandemic, I you know, got to stay in shape. So I started getting on a bike and <laughs> riding over the Golden Gate Bridge. And oh my, it's it, yeah, like got to get outside these days. And like, yeah, totally. Being at home for eight months, like, you go stir crazy. So yeah, I, I did the thing of adopting a puppy that was twelve weeks old. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. And that's yeah. that's got to do these things. Gotta say things. <laughs> and how's the baby? How's your child? And everything. Oh my gosh! So yeah, I've got two kids. Uh, oh yeah. Two and change and four months old. Oh my um, gosh. Yeah. So it's great. Like, yeah. This is, <laughs> this is a rare quiet moment in the house. Uh, I bet not. <laughs> so what do you think the future holds for technology and new ventures, you know, especially as we come out of this COVID, hopefully, environment and how things have changed for people, the acceptance of remoteness, the acceptance of being closer with things and more intense with your family, with your friends, with your what you're doing as as opposed to running kind of wild. I mean, we're certainly going to value time together a lot more than we may have taken it for granted mm -hmm. before. But I think I, like, at least for me personally, coming out of this, like we've got to work on the problems that matter. Right. And, like we got, we got whacked this year. Yeah. And, and like, as you said, like many folks saw some of these things coming. Like, again, like, you know, living in California, like the blazing forest fires that took oh. a lot of us down, right. And right. smoke filled skies for, for months and, you know, pandemic that's killed hundreds of thousands of people. Right. These are all things that could have been prevented. Mm -hmm. And if, if, we, if we work on solving these important problems, we can get a handle on them. Yeah. But if, if we continue working on, let's call it more photo sharing, then we're not going to make it. Yeah. And the other thing, I think education is going to change. Um, we've learned a lot about the issues for young children and the sociability of being in a class together, totally. as well as the intensity that they can learn and repeat and repeat in a remote sense. Uh, till they understand it, or people like uh, who are doing jump math, for example, to find ways to keep everybody up at a skill level, not just the two or three in the classroom that are getting it. Um, I, so I think education is starting to change too. Totally. I mean, I, 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 I mean, I, I, having you know, watching my my two year old try to sit in front of a Zoom and engage with family <laughs> members, it's it's super hard. Like, and it's hard to explain to her why she can't hang out with her grandparents. <laughs> It's super hard to explain. Yeah. And yeah. and their attention span is eight seconds. Yeah. You know, that's, <laughs> yeah. that's, the, that's the other thing. Totally. Well, this has been great. Um, I'm going to ask Shreya to step in and bring in some of the questions awesome. so that we get some from the audience and Let's the people it. 
that are going on. She She's ready, I think, right, Treya? So take it away. Thanks, Matt. Those were some great insights on creating a valuable business as well as businesses with value as they combine wealth creation with social impact along your entrepreneurial journey. Although Cheryl has been like awesome in asking you all the right questions in detail, but we as students are always hungry for more. So in that aspect, I'm representing my fellow students and uh, putting forward some questions that they have. Sounds good. So what are some of the analysis that you did in deciding the Nest Google deal? In retrospect, what would you have done differently? Oh, man. Uh, <laughs> it's a hard question, actually. Uh, and I'll, t I'll tell you, like, we didn't do a ton. It's, like, you like, think about, like, some of those, like, monumental life decisions and, like, not fully, like, you know, not drilling all the way deep on them. Like, we didn't competitively bid it. Like, mm -hmm. uh, uh, like Tony and I met with Larry Page just before Thanksgiving uh, in 2013. 20, yeah, 2013. And we really hit it off. We were super impressed with him. Like, we could learn from him. And, like, he could help us scale. And we kind of, it was a handshake deal. And we just did it. Uh, uh, and, like, looking back on it, like, you know, the scale of what that business has now done and what Google has done with it is like, could we have ever done that on our own? And you know, how hard is it to like build a large scale public market company? And you know, like Nest had years then to, to scale within Google that we probably would not have had the luxury to, to do otherwise. So yeah, like, you know, like we believed in Larry and, and he believed in us. That's awesome. So since many of the students are currently doing uh, customer discovery for their projects and products, like as entrepreneurs, future entrepreneurs, they're curious to know about the customer dis discovery process when you built Nest at that time. Ooh, so actually, I, I, I'll tell you a little about it, but actually I'll tell you how, what we've learned since then. Uh, so, we, you know, we, we did it actually very much from gut, uh, which is kind of the Apple DNA. And like, you know, we had super strong product intuition. Uh, uh, you know, like we wanted to make sure that we would love it ourselves. And we, and we did a lot of beta testing too. Like, you know, we put in about a thousand homes around the country, got feedback and yeah, you know, really my, my, my mom was in Florida and like broke her air conditioning over the summer. And so we learned, we learned a lot of hard lessons, but uh, actually since then, I actually, I think our proc thinking has, has refined, refined third further in that there's a lot you could do even before you're in product concept mm -hmm. to learn more about customers and like get their insights and, understand their pain points. And sometimes like folks don't know what they want before it exists, but you can at least deeply understand their pain points. So like, I'm a big fan now of doing further customer research and interviews and getting really, really deep before you hit the button and commit time and dollars to making it happen. Yeah, so like the groundwork is really important. In Super the important. Like there's a term of, like, in, like, in the industry called conviction. Mm -hmm. And like, you know, as a leadership team, you wanna have conviction that it's the right product to do. Perfect. So since you're like, you co-founded Insight and you invest in, investing in a number of ventures, um, students are curious to know, what are some of the red flags that you are looking mm. at? Ooh, okay. So, uh, uh, I mean, they're, they're actually a number. So like, like one of the ones that comes to mind the most, and like, I think about like, we've all had some of these meetings or like when, when entrepreneurs glaze over some of the details uh, and like, you know, if you ask a pressing detail, like, uh, you know, how are you going to build it? Or like, what is the key technology differentiation that allowed you to build this, this technology? And they're not able to explain it. It makes you question of, is it actually real? Or is this completely like science fiction? Uh, we, and we, we interviewed an entrepreneur for a, a potential uh, investment made two years ago, looking at some new fission power plant, like super, like, let's call it like complex out there. And we kept that like, so like, we don't understand like, how is this different than any other fission plant that's been built? And he was not able to explain it. So like, obviously this is not gonna happen. Like that's super, it was like bright, bright red flag. Uh, the, the other, I'd say like other bright red flag is all about like references and relationships. And uh, like we always background check our entrepreneurs with like either previous managers or folks they worked with. And like, we're looking for like, you know, ethical red flags or like, are they lying about something that's happened in their past? So like, yeah, like one, like always be straightforward about those kind of things. The world is really small. I'm curious to know if you have invested in any CMU startup though. Many, many, uh, probably like, you know, 10 or so if I were to guess. Whoa. 
Yeah, oh. actually, so most recently, uh, a small company called Delta Trainer, and they're still actually still based out in Pittsburgh. Uh, and, you know, like small team working on a fitness uh, product. And this is like, they started pre-COVID, but what they realized like, holy cow, like people can't go to gyms anymore. So it's, it, was, it was like, it was a really like, let's call it fortunate company at the right time, you know, helping people actually get fitness help without having to go to a gym. They can do it at home. Uh, yeah, super great team. Really excited to help them out. Definitely. Like I know about Delta T Trainer, like uh, they were in the Venture Bridge and the SWAT Center as well. So awesome yes. team, of course. Yeah, good folks. So what do you think are the core reasons that you invested in those startups? Like what, 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 is, what was there in the CMU based? teams like, like generally cmu dna is super deep on the passion front and i, I there's no shying away from hard work uh, which which is not common across across the rest of the the cohorts let's, let's call it, like uh, other universities uh I, cmu students don't take the easy way out and it's something that i really admire it's something that i i, I really cherish about my experience there and like when you spend 10 hours straight in a computer, I guess people don't spend 10 hours straight in computer clusters anymore, but uh, vir in virtual computer clusters, I guess. Uh, like you learn how to push, how to solve hard problems, how to work together as a team. Uh, and that's really important post-education. Like, that, like, that is like what it is to work in a company is like, can you work as a team? Uh, can you rely on others? Can you build relationships and can you solve hard problems? So shifting the gears a little bit. So what are some of the most challenging aspects of investing in the nonprofit space? Mm. Ooh. Uh, it's hard to build scalable nonprofits. Uh, so if you think about like a, a business, uh, like if things go well, you know, you could have revenue and revenue could drive profits, but then could drive, drive more scale. And there's a virtuous cycle of scale. Mm -hmm. It's one of the reasons why I think business is a good tool for change. So like with Nest, like if your product inherently saves energy, the more you sell, the more energy you save. Nonprofits are a little different. Like how do you scale a donor base? It's, it's all, it's really hard. It's either it's like you find people with bigger checkbooks to write or a lot more smaller donations and you aggregate millions of donors. Uh, it's really, really hard to do. It's it, like, extremely hard to do. So, uh, you know, having now helped many nonprofit startups get going, uh, like the ones who have been most successful are the ones that either are able to bring in, you know, the Gates foundations of the world or B the other way around of like, they take millions of $10 donations online as they've achieved more scaled impact. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. So what is one project or product that you're excited about in climate change? It's a lot, actually. Uh, I mean, I, I, I kind of touched on it a little bit earlier, but I am super excited about scaling uh, carbon removal. So like today, you know, like we've got e enormous climate problem and like emissions are, are flattening, but not, not like far from the rate we need. And the prospect of starting to undo that, like, and you know, like, you know, it's called, like clean up the pollution that we've had, I think is one of the biggest opportunities we have. And fortunately, like, you know, if things go well in, 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 you know, U.S. elections and we start to, to invest in the right things. I think we've got an opportunity in the next couple of years to really hit the gas, for the, the, the non-emissions <laughs> gas, uh, on, on a lot of these major climate solutions that we need to do. Yeah, so like, since you relate so much to um, this aspect of climate change, so in, in terms of like consumers, so we see that there's a growing amount of product waste that has been occurring throughout the century, specifically e-waste. Mm -hmm. So in your opinion, how can consumers be more, more mindful about their contributions to carbon emission? You know, like, like as a consumer, like you don't have that many lovers. I, I, uh, it's basically like, you know, how much do you drive? How much do you fly? What you consume, what you throw away. Uh, like those are kind of the big, the big levers. So uh, fortunately, unfortunately, like climate change is more than just about us. And I think there's like the things that we can do as consumers, like eat less meat, fly less, uh, you know, less single use plastic, uh, composting. Like there's, there's a small number of things we get to do. Really like to, to solve global climate change is going to require everyone, not just consumers, but like governments and industry to move. I think that like some of the big levers in climate change, like concrete and steel. It's like, 
that's double digit percentages of climate change. And like the, as consumers, like there's not really much you could do on the, on the lever of concrete and steel, but advocacy is something you can do. Like you could vote, uh, you can get your friends to vote. And like, these are things that like we all have to do because like, if we don't put the pressure on companies and the government, it's not going to happen. Right. So just the last question. So what is the most memorable experience you had in CMU? Oh, we're okay. just curious to know that as students. Yeah. It's a question I've never been asked before. Uh, <laughs> so I mean, I, I think about the work I did as a like undergrad researcher in, in my professor Yoki's lab. And I spent basically a summer designing human bones that we could then produce like mm -hmm. a, uh, replicas of them to build this robotic hand. And it was like one of those, like I was doing undergrad grant work, but required ridiculous focus and patience. Uh, and I spent hundreds of hours in the machine shop. And I think it was, it was a good lesson in, uh, in driving something to conclusion and not giving up halfway, despite it being ridiculously hard and tedious. Uh, Cause sometimes you got to do the work that's hard and tedious, but maybe you have the skill set to do and no one else does. And uh, I'm very thankful for that experience. And like, like Yoki, my professor at the time, kept pushing me to do it. And I'm glad I saw it all the way through despite it being a pain in the ass. Because uh, I learned a lot along the way. Okay, just, just one more. Just one more. I promise, Matt. So um, what are some of the skills that you focused on while you were at CMU? It's kind of important for us to know that you know, what are these skills that we should be looking at right now while we're just studying? Yeah, I did, it's funny because I didn't know the answer to that at the time. Uh, so, I, and I took a, a lot, I, I took a pretty large breadth of stuff. I, I went really deep in computer architecture and microelectronics and like software and embedded systems and robotics. But actually like looking back on it, like the most important thing I did was working on large scale team projects where you have to work together as a group with people of different disciplines. So I think about like, uh, I think he's still doing it, like how he chose its general robotics course. Uh, where like, it's, you know, software firmware engineers, working with mechanical engineers, working with electrical engineers, building an end-to-end -end robot in a very short amount of time. Uh, that is the stuff that is gold. And like, you think about like your day one, right out of college job, like that is what it's gonna be like. Like you're working with someone with a different skill set, and you've got to really quickly sync on like goals and working together. and you know, short-term milestones and making it happen. And, you know, sometimes someone's not pulling the rate and how can you shift and talk through those kind of problems? Like that is the stuff of, of, of super gold. And, uh, you know, like going back, like looking back on it, I wish I had taken more of those kind of courses uh, preparing me for the, the real world. Thank That's you. awesome. Like as part of like Integrated Innovation Institute, we do a lot of those courses here. Yeah. Uh, so I'm going to hand back to Cheryl. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Shreya. Those were great questions from the group and the ones you've added. Um, and, and Matt, one last uh, thought. When, when you were going through, was there an opportunity to integrate across disciplines? Because when you put a product together, it isn't just, as you were saying, a mechanical engineering or an electrical engineering all by itself, but it's how all of those pieces come together to form that team. I love the fact that you're thinking in terms of the value of, of teaming as well, not only the diversity of the team, the diversity in the disciplines of the team. Right. Yeah, I mean, that was just starting out when I was in school. It's like, you know, it's called like, year 2000 ish. That was kind of just, just uh, kind of becoming popular at CMU. And I was, you know, I was fortunate to be involved in some of those efforts. Uh, it was really, really valuable. And I, like, I, I know things have actually shifted and evolved a lot since then, but like my, my, my last visited campus before, before the dark times, <laughs> uh, like watching like design students from like the, the art school work with engineers on like, on building products and experiences. Like that is so critical. Because like, like, you know, talking about what it's like to work at Apple, like you're working with artists on products and, right. you know, people who have no technical backgrounds, but like are brilliant designers and like learning how to speak effectively different languages mm -hmm. uh, to build great products is required. Mm -hmm. like, like, anything about, uh, a lot of schools don't offer that. Like I, I, I you know, I, get a, I hired a lot over the years and I'd look at folks from other universities. Sometimes you'll, you'll talk to a, new grad software engineer who's only ever taken software engineering courses or computer science courses and really has never branched out from there. Right. 
Yeah, one of the things that we do in the technical ventures thing is tell the students along with Steve Blank, get out of the building, go talk to customers. A hundred percent. Yeah. yeah like there's, you could spend all your time in the lab building, but if you never talk to your customer, like you may get to the end and realize you completely diverged from what they actually needed or what, what problem that, that they had. Exactly, exactly. And, and, and it's a yin and yang. You want the problem and you want the solution and you want the problem because you need to be able to evolve uh, as you learn more. And that's, that I think is something that we value in, in our integrated environment here where we're putting together the engineering, the business and the design thinking. Yeah, it's critical. Yeah. Uh, again, like, that is what great teams are built from. Like when you have a monoculture, and I mean, mono, like there's monoculture from a lot of it, like monoculture from demographics, mm -hmm. from geographics, monoculture from expertise. Like, right. It, right. that's that's not how you how you build scalable problems. Yeah. Problem solving. Well, I thank you for your time. I know that Dave Mawinney also said he thanked you for speaking at the fall summit uh, that was just a while back. And yeah, I mean, I, I, again, I, I always like talking to CMU students, and again. I, so I'm going to drag you to our campus sooner or later. I I, I'd love to get back. I mean, I, <laughs> I used to travel a lot. I haven't, you know, again, we haven't been out of the house in eight months. It's I know, I know. Um, I'm just starting our first uh, you know, foray into uh, on in campus, on campus classes starting Amazing. next week. Amazing. And so we're all kind of going. Fingers crossed it all goes well. <laughs> all right. But thank you. Let's all give a big round of. Uh, applause and you you know, hugs, uh, you know, email hugs kind of thing. And I thank you for your time, the thoughts. Um, and I wish you continued success because you're really on some great trails. And awesome. I thank you very much, man. Thank you guys. Pleasure to see you again.